it Chris? Yes. Nancy Chris. Chris. Sherry yes. Carlson and Nancy Chris, how are you guys doing? They started the Olive Branch Production Company, writers, producers, directors. They wear many hats. How are you ladies doing? We're good. Yeah, we're doing awesome. We're excited to be on your podcast. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you so much for joining me. So so, so walk, walk a little bit into the beginning of what, what made you guys start the Olive Branch Production Company? What made you guys get into film? Where did it begin? Wow. Well, Sherry and I met a long time ago, probably, gosh, like 14 years ago now. Yeah. When I, I cast her daughter in one of the uh, another faith family film, we're doing a horse for summer. And we just kind of hit it off from there. And we've done several projects together. And we're just really big on uh, faith family films, especially nowadays. I think it's really needed. So we kind of branched off and we went from the West Coast to the East Coast. We're now actually both in Florida and we launched Olive Branch Studios over here together this past, well, it's been about a year now. Yep. We're getting ready to head into production on our first um, family film underneath our Olive Branch Studios. In between time, we've also developed a distribution company along the road, probably seven years ago. Yeah, Me and our pictures, at least. And we've acquired a lot of titles and um, helped get those distributed. And we launched our streaming platform, um, Olive Branch TV, that's on uh, Roku. Wow. So, um, so you guys have been busy. We've been busy. You guys have been busy. So, okay. So what was it like, uh, you know, for you guys working on, on the first film project together, right? You casted her daughter that, mm -hmm. that cultivated it and accumulated into this, this now, I, I want to say lifelong relationship into starting a studio, doing these other projects, launching a distribution channel, a distribution for other projects. Like what was the, the thing that made you guys click with each other so well? We're similar. We both have yeah. one daughter and they're both, you know, actors and, you know, we just clicked. It was yeah. just easy. It's, it, it's hard, you know, in this business, everybody in the entertainment business, it's hard to find people you trust and live up to and have honor about them. And I think that's what brought us together because we both had that same morals and values. And it's about taking care of people and um, just doing what's right. You know, we're filmmakers. And that's one of the reasons why we started our distribution company, because we got tired of being ripped off on all of our titles. It didn't matter who had them. And it's a lot of the studios. I'm not going to name names. But it's just trying to get paid was a bear. So we launched our own distribution and the same thing we're doing with Olive Branch Studios and all the content that we're looking for there. We have 24 seven access to accounting. So the filmmakers never have to come to us and say, well, where's my report? Where's my money? They can just log into their account and see it update. Whenever we get an update or get money, then we add it to their account. And so it's always in front of them. They always have access. So we try to be very transparent because that's what lacks in this industry. And we try and keep the cost down so that they can yeah. make some money back. That's really important. And then from a distribution standpoint, how long do you guys uh, typically hold titles? I, I know that, you know, filmmakers can negotiate and stuff, but like on, on an average, how long do you guys typically hold titles? And then what titles or genres do you guys, are you guys looking for? Is it faith-based, family, you know, good-hearted films? What, what's it like with you guys? So we, um, we're looking for, we've got Olive Branch TV, but we're also going to launch another um, channel called Quanio. So we're looking for just about every type of genre. Um, and on the streaming platform that we're doing on Roku for those two channels, those are one year licenses and they can, they auto renew unless they decide not to renew them and they're non-exclusive. So it doesn't matter if they have them on, uh, you know, any other platform or with another distributor, as long as they carve out that they can, um, put it with us, that's fine. Um, 
And then as far as like the major films, what are those, Nance? Three years or five years? I can't remember. what. Five we, years. Five years. Uh, auto renewal unless they cancel. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So. so you guys went through the predatory tactic or the predatory spaces of distribution uh, with your earlier films. You learned your lessons and then you guys mm -hmm. said, hey, we want to help other filmmakers. So let's start our own distribution. Exactly. Correct. Oh, that, that is, that's awesome. What, so what, what made you guys do the genre of family films, good hearted, like that, that space, what made you guys want to make those films? Because you're absolutely right earlier. You said, Hey, you feel like the world needs it. And I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree that, you know, if you yeah. think about any like Adam Sandler movie or like a Disney movie, you can watch it so much on repeat because um, it's so clean. Yeah. Yep. And that's why, like, the first film we did, A Horse for Summer, that I had Cherry's daughter on, is still playing. We filmed that, like, 14 years ago, and it's still real, really good. But it's a faith family horse movies. And people just, you know, they watch that content over and over again. And, you know, we get so many people reaching out to us. I'd always like, thank you for doing films that the whole family can watch. And so that's important to us, you know. Do you feel like um, faith-based films uh, do well? Uh, or do you guys, uh, you guys have the numbers. So do they do well compared to other stuff? They do. They do. If you have, so for tidbit for filmmakers out there that are watching this, if you do a faith family friendly film that's based with especially horses, that's a huge selling point. Um, those types of films you kind of can't do wrong with. Same with Christmas movies. Those films are always picked up and they're always played time and time again. It's, it's much needed and they do a lot better than like the horror thriller comedy dramas. Um, they're a safe bet to make money on for a filmmaker. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Because a, a, a kid can watch it. A right. parent can watch Like at any age, any, it doesn't matter. If it feels right. good, it feels good. Well, here's an example. This has gone back a long time. When, when we had the red carpet premiere out in LA for a horse for summer, there was, and we were doing the Q&A afterwards, and I'll never forget this moment because a little girl raised her hand. And you know what she said to me? Hmm. She goes, I just want to thank you. Your, your film touched my heart. This was like a little five-year-old girl. I'm about to make me cry on stage because of the fact of A Horse for Summer is really more for teens, young adults. It really wasn't for the smaller kids yet they really took to it. And that was just a comment I will never forget at a Q&A. Was that the aha moment for you guys to be like, okay, this is, oh, this is yeah. our calling? Oh, yeah, we're, we're doing what's right. You yeah. know, we can, that, that's huge. And I'll never forget that feeling. I'll never forget that moment. And, and, and uh, what about you, Sherry? Um, yeah, you know, I, I want to do this because, um, there's a lot of stories that we can tell. And, and I think there's a lot of unnecessary violence and unnecessary sexual situations, um, that are actually over explained in film because they show everything, you know, and I just like doing things like this so that, you know, it's, I don't have to worry about it. If one day I hope I have grandkids and these are the types of movies that I want them to watch. I know that they're not going to be overexposed to things that, you know, kind of desensitize us to how other people are feeling in the world, you know, cause you start putting a lot of things in your mind that doesn't need to be there. So we're trying to, you know, do this. We're working on another faith-based um, film right now. Um, with horses in it and and teen girls, so of did course say, our girls did you say are horses. Cool. Horses and teen girls. That's like the mix right there. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, you know, we uh, we're just finishing the last part of the fundraising, and we opened that up to product placement to help us get the rest of the funds right. for this. 
And um, it is going on what I call a nano budget, which, as you know, is smaller than a micro budget. <laughs> but um, I, I think we're going to be able to do a really good film. And I think a lot of people are going to like it. And we happen to be down here in Florida where there are so many horses and rodeos and things like that that are going on. And that's the name of the it's Nancy's daughter's story um, that she came up with. And she's a she's a up and coming barrel racer. So, yeah, um, and it's called Last Rodeo. Right. One more so. doing right now that we're um, certainly active looking for product placement. So yeah. if anybody out there is interested, please get a hold of us. Super, super affordable uh, because we're just looking to make sure we can cover our costs and then get it out there. So, um, when you say nano budget, you don't have to give me exact, but what's the, I guess, the range of budget that this latest film will be made with? It'll be under fifty. Okay, mm -hmm. but but being that you guys have already have a track record with face based family, good film, horses, teenagers, you you know that hey. If it costs us under 50 to make it, we can probably make 50 plus with it. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Especially if it, you know, every year it just keeps going on and on. And people seem right. to like that, that type of uh, um, style of film, you know, girls love horses and you know, what is it? Boys and dogs, girls and yeah. horses. We haven't done the dogs with the boys yet. No, we need to, but that, so that's just kind of your formula for the filmmakers out there. It's a girl and her horse or a dog and a boy, and you don't reverse it. It's not a boy and his horse or a dog and a girl. The, the working formula that works is um, a girl and a horse and a dog and a boy. Yeah, that, that's interesting because, I, I, you know, I, I, I want to ask you, how did you stumble upon this formula? Um, for myself as a filmmaker, I've pretty much done every genre outside of horror but my next film is a horror film uh how did you guys stumble upon the faith family good nature like you know just like re research and then talking to the major studios you know we work with them all with lions gate just about everybody you can think of and the same okay. thing when before dvd kind of went by the wayside it was, we have a direct uh, distribution deal with Walmart. And basically, if you put a horse on the cover of your DVD, it increased your sales and marketing by 25%, which, it, which that still can apply for streaming. It's the minute you put a horse on the cover with a girl, it really changes and it adds, it increases your um, revenue. Just that, by making sure you have the horse on the cover. That is so interesting. So what's, being that you guys have your own distribution company now, and you guys have been through the different phases of distribution when you have your, <laughs> your physical sales and then now streaming, what's the biggest changes and challenges that filmmakers will face today when it comes to distribution? You know, we all like to talk about the filmmaking process and how fun that is, but the business side, the, the quality control, the back end is where the real game really starts after you make the project. So what is that like? I mean, this day and age, to everybody, it's either go with a smaller distributor like what we're doing so you have more control or distribute it yourself. There's so many avenues out there. Keep, keep control of it because like everybody else, I'm sick of losing money on films that are out of my control. And last rodeo will distribute a hundred percent ourselves because I'm not going to have that happen again. Um, so basically that's it. Just, I would suggest like finding the smaller distributors or even if you work a non-exclusive deal with them, but I would try to keep control of your film as much as possible. And with everything changing, that's why you have to do the nano budgets. And it's like, if you look at our films, you'll see the quality and you see the quality of the trailers. We don't waste money. We don't spend one penny we don't need to spend. And we try to put every dime we have on screen. So I think if they'll go and research our trailers, like the sparrows, fishes and loaves, a horse for summer, 
you can see the quality and what you can do with low budget filmmaking. Like, don't think you have to have a big budget out there and millions of dollars to do it with a change of all the gear and cameras and shoot, like you can shoot 8K on an iPhone now. It's incredible. Just use your resources, get creative and start thinking outside the box. And you're going to be able to actually build yourself a career. And I, and I think also that a lot of filmmakers, when they do go with a distributor, they're thinking, okay, my job is done. Let me move on to the next film. And there really is a marketing piece that the filmmakers should also be responsible for. Otherwise, you are getting um, very inflated marketing fees coming out of whatever profits you have. And um, so, you know, we asked our filmmakers that, you know, come on and, and give us their projects to just keep marketing it out there. Because, you know, mm -hmm. while we're going to do our best to do the same, we don't want to sit there and spend all their profits on marketing when they're capable of, you know, reaching out to people who follow them, their fan base, whatever, to, you know, go ahead and market that way. So, yeah, I think that's probably one of the most uh, egregious things about distribution are the, the tacked on fees that mm -hmm. don't necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, come from your project, you know, like if, if, Hey, if this distributor is going to go to cans or whatever, they may tack a portion of that trip onto your, right. you know, budgeting fee. So it, it's, it's a very delicate, um, it, it typically has a negative energy surrounding it, but I'm glad that you guys are trying to make right by your films and your distribution and, and trying to help out the, the smaller filmmakers out there. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's hard because, and that's why it takes a team, it takes a village, it takes us and you. So you can't expect us as a distributor to do everything because it literally does take us all to get it out there. And it's like we explain a lot of filmmakers because we take, we've taken a lot of titles that don't have no names in them. We can get your project out there. We can't guarantee the sales. We can't guarantee that the people are going to love it and buy it and it's going to go viral and you're going to make millions. You know, that's up to the market and the quality of your film. What we can do is at least get it out there for you where a lot of smaller films never had that opportunity because they didn't have any name actors in them. Right. And, you know, I sat in one of the um, very well-known distributors offices and um, sat there and looked at what there was over 30 some thousand journal entries on, yeah. <laughs> our, account, uh, on our expense account because um, we just could not believe that this film was not making any money. But there's a lot of waste. And so our goal is to not have that waste. You know, if if the outlet orders the DVD and then a week later returns the DVD only to order more of the DVD, only to return the DVD, there are so many fees associated besides the freight, the handling and stuff like that. Make no wonder filmmakers don't make any money, you know? Mm -hmm. So we decided we're just not going to do that anymore. And um, so we made some... Um, uh, what do you call it, uh, partnerships with um, different people. And, you know, we lean on those to get the titles out. What would you guys say is um, is a really good strategy for, uh, it, there's an indie filmmaker out there, they just finished their project, they're about to go into uh, marketing their project. Uh, when you think about cost that's associated with it, we typically don't have hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to put towards marketing. We have maybe $1,000. What do you think is the best strategy to use that thousand dollars to get the most eyeballs on that indie project? I would probably have to say, I don't know how you feel, but I'd say social media. Yeah, that's probably where social media and also maybe podcasts like this one. Yeah. Um, uh, and lean in, you know, to your um, talent and ask them to, you know, because it does them good to be seen as well. Um, sorry, I've got something going on in the background that's distracting me. Um, but yeah, I think social media is where most of it is and just putting your money into that. And the ads are really costly on that as well. So maybe do, like Nance and I are going to go live on TikTok 
and we're going to be talking about our next project um, and how people can get involved and support us. Um, Cause you know, you never know, there might be a coffee company out there that wants to be featured in the diner scene that we have. Um, and it's super inexpensive for them, but it's super important for us because that little bit of money that we get is going to maybe help with wardrobe or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I got on a tangent. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Keep the tangents coming. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So you're, you're in the phase of raising these funds, getting these product placements and stuff. How has it been creating your team behind the scenes to make these projects? I know we wear a lot of, a lot of hats as indie filmmakers, but mm -hmm. what was it like? How did you get your team? How did you source them? Like, what was that process like? Well, we've used a lot of the same, same filmmakers for our crew from picture to picture. Um, obviously we can't do that now that we're on the East coast, not, and not the West coast. So we'll be putting a whole new crew together. And basically you kind of weave them out as you go, you see who works and clicks with your group. And, and I like to shoot with the same crew as much as possible, mainly because you get in a rhythm, you know, what each other thinks in your sets can run so much smooth, smoother. And the big thing I got to say, do not skip on your pre-production. Everybody's so excited to get in production, but the longer pre-production you can do, the less headaches you're going to have on set and you get everything worked out. So it's, we shoot with a very small crew like this next film, we'll literally shoot it with about 10 people. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so what are some, what are some things that I guess during your years of making projects, what are some um, things that you've encountered that have caused headache? And then what were like the solutions that you guys take moving forward with the different projects? Hmm. God, I really think it's just people. <laughs> All of our headaches. Yeah. I mean, we've always we've been pretty lucky with um locations are always good. Yeah. Yeah, our locations. We never had those really fall out. We've been a little good at being creative and just another side note to help filmmakers. Don't forget to reach out for catering and craft services to help you out because we had like Olive Branch cater our lunch one day. We had a lot of companies cater, which saves us a lot of money in our budget because they donated the meals that day. So, but you know, gosh, I want to say knock on wood. When we're on set, we really haven't had any issues. Yeah, we've been. So, and been. that again goes back to make sure you do your pre production the right way. Don't shortcut it. And I think that's what allowed us to have such smooth productions. I my daughter's been on sets where there have been um things that happen like uh they plan to shoot at midnight at a specific location and they got uh what the information tied up wrong and we get there and had to completely try to figure out how to do the scene outside in front of the building instead of going into the building <laughs> so things like that happen um and i'm trying to think there was uh there was something else i just cannot remember what it was but um you know it, it does happen on some of the sets but nancy's right we always plan a lot and um mm -hmm. you know so what, what are some of the things for that filmmaker that's about to start their project? They're in the pre-production, they're in the planning stage. What are some key elements of that uh, pre-production that they should focus on and really tighten up? Well, that's pretty much all of it. <laughs> you can't, like I keep saying, you can't shortcut anything, you know, and make sure you interview your crew if you haven't worked with them before get a read of personality because when you're on set it really is personality so hoping that you guys all click and can get along and that, that means going out to dinner beforehand we've done that even with ca with cast and crew just so we can have an idea that hey yeah i'm gonna enjoy working with this person because i mean that's crucial 
I've, I've been on sets that aren't ours that we weren't in control of. And it's been a nightmare. I've had where the whole crew walked off one day and I had to beg them to come back the, on a film I was directing for the actors. Wait, so like, a whole crew walked off? A whole that? crew, yep. What was when that, I was what was that like? I got a call from the hotel from a producer and I was just like, what are you talking about? And so I had to go talk to the crew and the first AD and I'm like, look, let's just shoot this the way we know how to make a good film and try to ignore everything's behind. But we've got a lot of great actors on set and we owe it to them. So whether you're mad at production or not, let's do it for them and let's take pride in the work that we're doing and just march through and get this film done, which we did. And I got them all back on set the next day, but that's because I had relationships in the key position where people I brought in. And so they trusted in me. So that's why I'm saying relationships are very crucial with your crew. That, that, you know, as you say that, I think about it like, man, as a director, that has to be one of like your worst nightmares. Oh, yeah. It was stressful. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, no, everyone's leaving. Where are you guys going? What's going on? I'm like, like watch, I have no crew. <laughs> We're supposed to start filming in a couple hours. What are you talking about? Well, if you had the caterer of the century, that could have uh, probably stopped oh, that from just... happening. <laughs> Now, also, I I got to give a shout out because I keep seeing him floating in the background back there. But Mr. Yeah. Chef Eric, he we he's um, so honored that he's doing, catering our next film. But we were on a project that Eric catered for us uh, years ago. And literally our crew and cast were willing to work for free. And they gave him a standing ovation, and I've never had that on a film set. Is that they weren't they weren't working for free, but they said they, they were. Didn't... But they were all like, "If Eric's catering any one of your projects again, we'll work for free." Is that how good his food uh, is? Oh my god! Yes, my god! If you this, need a caterer, this... you need to shout out to her husband. He does all the big films, but oh yeah, that that was incredible. So that's why I'm saying your whole crew all the way down to that it is so important because i think what's behind the scenes shows up on the scenes so if you're shooting a comedy and your whole crew's fighting do you think that's really going to show up on screen it's going to affect everything right so to me it, it's really important that your crew and cast and everybody get along and if you don't, then the hunt for the next one. That's why I'm like, make sure your locations are secure. Just make sure everything's secure. You do your due diligence. So on day one, when you say roll cameras, everything's running smooth. Everybody's happy. Everybody knows their job. So, and I, I'd say we've we've had drum, pretty much drum of free sets on most of all of our stuff. Our stuff, yeah. So yeah, our stuff. So Sherry's family is just a bunch of creatives. You got the creative chef. You got the actress. Yes, yes. writer. Sherry's a writer, yes. So is Nancy's family. I mean, she her daughter's an actor. And Nancy was on the screen uh, yeah. on movies before. Yeah. So. Oh, you've done some movies in the past too, Nancy, as an actress? Yeah, I started out when I was really young. The first thing I ever did, and I'm dating myself, was a scene in Petrocelli. Oh, okay. TV series by Paramount. And I was just like, wow, this is pretty cool. You get paid to do this. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, you get, have fun. But I now I have more enjoyment behind the camera than I actually do on screen. I'm not. I, I like directing and producing. I like being able to put it all together and then see the outcome. That's what I like. Sure. How did you guys get those connections with the Lions Gates and, and, and things like that? Because, you know, a lot of times if you go look for these these people in their email, whether you use an IMDb Pro or anything, it's just you can't find them. So how did you guys even get these contacts? You can't. Yeah. And basically, 
it's because we already did some films and we went through a sales agent, which then they link you up with the people like at Lionsgate and stuff, and you start working with them directly to do deliverables and et cetera. So you start meeting people, but when we first did it, all of our connections came through, unfortunately, and had to go through like a sales agent to meet the actual distributor. So, and but game has changed so much now, you know. Like we used to have a booth at AFM, and we had a room there during the big market and stuff. And so we met a lot of people there. But right now, like I try to keep control of your film as much as you can and just get creative and getting it out there and who you talk to, whether it's going to the film festivals or these podcasts. Every little bit takes something away from that you can learn from. Would you go ahead, Sherry? I was just going to say, and you know, the people you meet along the way, they end up moving jobs and they remember you. You know, like we have contacts um, that worked at NBC that, you know, mm -hmm. we can call um, uh, Oscar winning um, director, writer. I mean, there's a lot of, of people that you meet along the way that you know, their careers develop and you're still friends with them. There's still, in, you know, contacts in your phone. That's why right. you didn't get rid of the phone. <laughs> Would you say um, getting a sales agent now uh, in today's market, in today's world, is still something that's worth it? Wow, that's a tough one. Right, because for the I, sales I agent- I think a smaller film, probably not. You'll never see money. Um, even if it's a bigger film, like we had a lot of names in those in the one, and it is still astronomical. The films made millions of dollars, but we're still in the hole. What, so, so, so why, so why is that? Distributor, I'm like, how is that possible? That's what I was going to ask. So, is, is that because the distributor yeah. is just uh, uh, raising prices on things that don't necessarily cost that much, and just making it to where you guys just don't get anything? Is that what's happening? Well, plus you, uh, they also, some of the contracts have written in that they're going to spend X number of dollars per year. And how do you know that they actually spent it? You know, yeah. they're just, uh, you, you know, if you're not seeing the marketing yet, you have, you know, 50,000 being spent every year on marketing, you know, that's your profit that goes and stays in their pockets. Well, I, well, I will say if, if the film uh, has made millions of dollars, then an exorbitant amount of money has been spent on marketing, right? Because we know, or I know, if I spend a thousand dollars to market a film, it's like, mm, I don't necessarily know if I get that thousand dollars back in views. And then at that point, you're not even making a profit because of all the effort and money and sweat equity that went into making that project to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's such a tough thing to where it's like, you it almost... Is. You almost have to have a, a a home run to where that film made ten million dollars on a hundred thousand dollar budget. It's undeniable. Where's my money? Yep, exactly. pretty much. I mean, we've shot some that are under three hundred thousand. That's done millions of dollars, and we still don't see it. So that's that was one of the main things why we started our own distribution you know when i'm paying twenty five thousand for encoding where we do it for like four hundred dollars right where, where's the difference like why and and the main thing i don't have a huge studio you know it's a handful of us at olive branch or our uh distribution company and our pictures where we don't have to put in all the overhead. So, you know, our deliverables isn't costing 25, 50,000. It's yeah. more like 450 bucks when we're all done. Yeah, those prices are just so crazy where most, mm -hmm. you know, in, in today's world, most YouTubers uh, who do their own content and then use Final Cut Pro or DaVinci Resolve or anything like that, mm -hmm. they know how to export import right. and do all that stuff to where the just the thought of someone charging 30 40 50 thousand dollars for qc is just out of this and world so, like what makes you think that because you clicked a couple buttons for your mm -hmm. computer to actually you didn't write the code for the software you just said okay export this right. format 
fifty thousand. That's just crazy. And off of the high res files, we give them to work with. Right now, I I have heard in the past, and I don't know if you guys have ever worked with someone like a Netflix. But with Netflix, they their quality control and what they have the filmmaker do is pretty strict and pretty long right. compared to mm -hmm. getting it on like a Tubi or like an Amazon Prime. Have you guys ever worked with Netflix or anything like that? Yes, I've picked up several of our titles. And how, how was that? It's, um, I mean, ours were shot in the format that was accepted by them, but I do know they have a lot of criteria down to what camera you shoot with. <clears throat> if you don't shoot with one of their approved cameras, you're not going to get picked up by them. But also, I, I don't know if they're paying like they did before. Um, it seems like they dropped a lot and what they're offering like they picked up a horse for summer and we got a really good deal on that but you know we've shot everything in the format and we've gone through their qc pretty easy so i just think if if netflix is your end game and that's important when you're filming where do you see your picture where do you see your audience know all that before you go into production because if you're looking for a netflix deal then make sure you're shooting and you're following all their guidelines of how your film has to be shot, what format, what cameras they'll approve, and who's got to be in it. What? How, how did you guys get that Netflix uh, uh, contact to submit, or did they reach out to it you? It was through our sales agent. Okay, so... That's why I'm saying in the beginning. So it depends on your project. Um. And, and, you know, your sales agent should be up front with you and tell you, no, Netflix is going to take this. They, they have a good idea of what they will accept or not accept or what they're looking for. And that's the other thing. We've developed a lot of relationships where we'll go out and say, okay, this is who we have in the film. This is our budget. What kind of return can we see? and run numbers and then get back to you and say, well, if you have this person, this person, it will carry it. So it just kind of, it just depends. This was a long time ago, but this was having one of the A actors we were dealing with. It's like, just have them in for 15 minutes and you know, it's your $5 million budget is guaranteed. So, so would you say that that's still like a, a prominent thing today where having an A-list or B-list or in your film still makes a big difference with distribution in today's it, it world? It does. Yeah. If you're going for major distribution, definitely. Especially global. So, yeah. yeah. Do you think that major distribution is needed for indie filmmakers to have a successful film that actually makes no. a profit? No. That's why I'm saying doing it yourself. So here's an example. We know if we put out three small films a year and we keep control of them and we build that catalog up over like 10 years, you know, it takes a while by the time you shoot and get through post year, you're a year down the road. So we know within a couple of years, we can fund it where we're all making decent income and we can do it full time. So, so what's that, what's that number? You said three a year. What do you think about 15 titles? If you could have 15 titles out there. If you're self distributing and you got 15 titles out there and you got them on all the streaming platforms and you're, and you're following like faith, family, Christmas movies, it depends on the movie you have. You should be able to make about a hundred grand a year doing that. I, I might need to go ahead and, and write me a faith movie. <laughs> um, but it's building your catalog and building it with the right content. Though. Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot. So my, I have two films that I went with the distributor. I went with a, a bigger distributor, then I went with a local distrib distributor. And then I have two films now. Um, one is kind of like my baby. I've submitted it to like the Sundances and stuff. And mm -hmm. then I have another one that we have a one last scene that we're shooting tomorrow and then that movie will go into post-production. So those two last later films will be the films that I self-distribute. Um, just, just because I went through that process 
of okay i went through this distributor i went through this distributor not to say that they uh did anything wrong uh because i don't want to i don't want to bad mouth them right. or anything like that but i know that if i'm responsible for the marketing and i'm going to spend the money and everything like that it's kind of like what you guys said well then why would i give that movie away unless Unless I always say this because every filmmaker, we all have this this goal and this dream. Unless you can get it to a platform like a Hulu or a Netflix or a HBO Max or something that I cannot get to, which right. you know, then where does the benefit lie? Yeah. So you know, it's it's yeah, just, and that's why I'm saying it's really a per project basis. You gotta you know determine what you're doing with this film, who you're going to put in it and where you want it, the outcome be. If you want it on Netflix, if you, you know, if you're looking for the big streaming platforms and partnerships and yeah, you're still, even today, you're going to have to go through a sales agent because they won't open those doors unless you personally have a big enough catalog that can open that door for yourself. So would you say, uh, it, that's that's a great point. So would you say, you know, typically we finish one film, we're really happy and we're like, hey, right, can we get it out there? Who's gonna distribute it, um, you know? But would you say it's more powerful for the filmmaker to have multiple films when they come and say, hey, I have two films or I have three films? Yeah, I know, they, they like filmmakers that have a catalog. I mean, it's easier for them. Um, and they know, I think they know that you take your craft a little more serious, not in here and just, oh, I want to make a film. That you're, you're in here career-wise and everything else. And just, you made me think of something, and I just want to go back one second, is you said you're making a film, you got all done, you're excited, and you want to get it out there. And that's the biggest problem that I see with a lot of filmmakers is then you're on to your next one. What can I do next? And you forget about your title. Yep. And it takes years to market these. Just because you're done and it's out there, don't forget about it. Don't just leave it and go on to your next one or it's not going to succeed. It's like anything. You have to put the work and the time in it. At one point, it was your main baby. You loved it. Don't set it aside for the next kid. And it's like, you got to keep marking them and keep them going, no matter how old the title is. Don't, so that all your catalogs start building and they stay there and they don't start dwindling because of the next project. And that's hard. I know it's hard to keep the motivation going, but that's important. But also um, in the industry, they want to know what's next. So, um, you know, yeah. it's... That's why I'm saying, yeah, you should have more than one. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're having a meeting, say, hey, here's my current project. These are the next three we have in the works. Whether you got them funded or not, have something in the works so you have something important when you go in that meeting because you never know. They may say, oh, cool, what is it? And so, they're like, we love it. We'll fund it. Yeah, that's, that's, don't know. that's so powerful and that's so fascinating because that's part of, you know, my strategy, right? It's like, hey, I have these two projects finished, but I also have these two scripts, scripts that I can mm -hmm. I can literally go film right now. But I, I almost want to, you know, take that point of like, hey, this is what we finished. This is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like. This is the project. And then when they ask the, well, what else do you have? Right. You have you know, these other scripts in the back, in your back pocket compared to you finally get that opportunity to get to that table. And when they ask you, what else do you have? You don't have anything. Yeah. You don't want that. that it's those, <laughs> yeah. It's those one hit wonders that you hear about on the radio and stuff like that. Uh, they didn't have the next thing working and you know, it fizzles right out. Mm -hmm. So you gotta have stuff in your pipeline, especially if you get those big meetings. Don't go in there without having something else in your pipeline. So how does one go about even even getting those big meetings? Do you have to be a festival baby? Do you have to have a big hit? Like, how do you even get those meetings? Oh, hey, that's a good point, too. I'm going to backtrack on film festivals. Because one thing I see in this going back on distribution in, people are like, oh, I've won 30 awards on my film. 
Well, now you've been at every film festival and who wants to see your film? Everybody's seen it at the film festival. So it's hard to market those. So I see a lot of filmmakers, like my suggestion, it's just my suggestion and thought of being in this business for God, I don't know how many decades is pick five, six film festivals that you really want to go to. Once you get those accolades and you have your laurels, stop. Don't oversaturate the market for free with your film out there at film festivals. Take those and now you have award-winning film and you can help market it, but it hasn't been oversaturated in the market. Or it's like, wow, we've already seen that. It's been out, it's been at every film festival there is. It's really hard to sell those. And there, there are some of the bigger platforms at, you know, these more visible um, desired film festivals too. So be real strategic about where you want to uh, mm -hmm. submit and hopefully, you know, are able to um, get picked for it. Cause they're there, Hulu's there, Netflix is there. I mean, you know, or you can go and shop at AFM too. I, I, I heard it was in Vegas this year. Hey, and I can tell you something that happened to me on a film I did. And I'm not sure how they even got word of it. But one day, checking my emails. And this is after the very first film I ever did. It was a Western comedy. I got an email in my inbox from NBC saying, hey, we heard you had a Western comedy. And we want you to come in and meet with us. And it's just like, I'm like, what? Yeah. So there was no sales agent. There was nothing. Somehow they got winded. And I don't know if it was one of the film festivals or what, but I woke up to an email. I went into NBC, had a meeting with them. It was one we did with uh, Christopher Atkins and myself. We did this film. And... I went into NBC, had a meeting with them. They were looking at launching it off of one of their other channels and putting together a Western comedy series, TV series. And they wanted to talk to us about ours. And unfortunately, it kind of unfolded because the person that was in charge of it, of course, moved to a different apartment. But basically, they told me, you don't have television experience of doing this or producing and directing. So go put yourself a crew together, which we did. We started putting the crew together. I got a hold of this is dating back to uh, Chuck, who was one of the directors for Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Loved the project. He was coming aboard as a director for it. So it's like you never know. You don't know who's going to see what or where they're going to see it or where you may wake up and get an email or a phone call from a studio or a network that you had no idea would ever come to you. Would you? I mean, that, that was pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, that to get any anything from the NBC, the ABC, the Fox, the Netflix, the who, like anything is exciting. Yeah. But would you say, uh, Sherry, back to your point, um, that in today's climate, Right. You have you have a film or you have two films. And would you say it's strategically a better option or it's viable for you to be like, hey, where's AFM at this year? I'm going to go attend that with these films. Mm -hmm. it, it can't hurt, you know, and, and I would entertain all the offers really carefully to make sure you get the best thing. I don't know that um, <clears throat> on smaller indies, if you get an MG anymore, but it's something to consider because, you know, it may not be. The MGs we used to get 10, 15 years ago, um, but depending upon what your budget is, it might be good to do that so that you get that exposure and experience or just shop it around and maybe do your own deals and do all uh, non-exclusives with everybody if you can. I don't even know if you can do that. I mean, Netflix probably wants it. Netflix won't. Yeah. 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 They're not a year exclusive, I think. Yeah, I think so. So. And then Netflix, they don't pay until the end of its cycle, right? Well, we we got paid uh, MG up front. <clears throat> okay. Netflix. So that was a win. That, that was just... That was a while ago, though. I don't think they're doing yeah. that anymore. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I and to be honest, I don't know how their pay schedule works right now. 
um, everything like over the last three to five years is rapidly changing. W would you say that with with everything going on that most films now, um, especially in the indie space, even the low budget studios, most have to be made on nano budgets to even survive or be made yeah, in, it, in general? You're not gonna make money, unfortunately. That's like the streaming platforms have been phenomenal, but it also has drove down what you can make yeah. um, profit wise, because they're not gonna pay the big bucks. It's not going to the theater or television. You know, it's, it's streaming. So in order to make money in today's market, you got to have your budget down there. Like if you can shoot something under 50, you better shoot it under 50 to have a chance to make money right now. Unfortunately, that's what we're seeing. And that doesn't it could be different, but that's what we're seeing. Yeah. And, you know, from from I guess from an outsider looking in, it doesn't seem like it's going to change. It seems like it's only going to no. get worse. It seems I like so. it seems like for the filmmakers, because we're, we're, we're leaving the Disney's and the Marvel's out of this discussion. Right. They have right. unlimited right. resources. But right. for most of the the indie filmmakers, the solo guys, the small teams, it's like the, the the light to make the money from the film, it's almost, I don't want to say it's gone, but that well that used to be very big yeah. is now so depleted yeah. that a, a movie isn't cherished anymore like how it was in the 80s and 90s when you went to Blockbuster, you rented it for three days, you watched it four right. times, it was an event. Now it's like, I refer to movies as just content. It's just, it's yeah, something to do when you have nothing to do. Right. And there's a lot of content out there and there's more and more being created because it's a little easier or maybe a lot easier for people mm -hmm. to do content, even if they have no experience. There's, I see on Facebook, there's a lot of people doing their first project um, and I'm surprised at how many first projects are, are people are trying to work on, you know, um, there's just everybody jumping in to tell the story and storytelling is, you know, people love stories, so that's never going to go away, but you know, you got the TikToks and everybody's doing their reels on Instagram and, you know, it's a, it's a big, big sea that you're jumping into to try and catch attention. So. Yeah, and unfortunately, and well, and actually, we were just talking about this yesterday. I brought up to Sherry. Have you noticed the big, huge incline of shorts? Like yeah. shorts are really popular right now, and there's a bunch of channels and apps that are just, and they just have really short content. It's only a few minutes long, but they're doing really good. I was like three, five minutes episodes. Yeah, I was watching one that had one minute episodes. And it's like, yeah. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, they did an episode in a minute. So I'm going to go back and watch it again. So, let, they so did, that's a good did point, it. right? Because, okay, so our generations, uh, I'm going to put myself within your generation because I grew up renting movies, wait for the yeah. weekend, blockbuster, video warehouse. That was my thing, right? And I used to work at a, this place called Movie Stop where I only worked there so I could watch all the new releases, right <laughs> physical media but the the generation of my kids their instagram tiktok shorts youtube mm -hmm. like right so they're used to 30 seconds one minute scroll 30 seconds one yeah. minute scroll yeah. so yeah. that might be very interesting that maybe there's a larger pool of of money for creatives to make instead of making a 90 minute feature you're making a 90 episode uh short uh series where instead mm -hmm. of writing for the three arcs you're now writing for the minute and that minute is your break yeah yeah because the extension the uh tension span right now is so low and it's like i i think it is the younger generation and it's like they're like swipe on to the next one like you better catch them in those few seconds to even hold them for one minute yeah. So it's like they really like they're not big into watching TV or anything else. It's just they would rather watch on their phone or laptop or iPad. And it's just they like the short content. So like filmmakers breaking in right now, I would say go that way.
because it's extremely popular right now. It's a great way to hone your skills. Um, and it takes a lot to be creative and to keep attention span and to be able to get something across in just a couple minutes. Do you like, guys- I'm not a writer, so kudos to Sherry and people that can do that. But um, I'm just seeing, we were literally talking about coming up with a little short series ourselves last night. We were just talking about it. I said, let's do a little, like, horse family, some, some kind of concept that's uh, just shorts. And do a little short series that's out there. Would you say as a writer, Sherry, that writing to the short is very different than taking a movie and just cutting it up into one minute pieces? Yeah, I see a lot of people doing that um, so that, you know, there's flow. But yeah, it's there. I think they're all little mini episodes. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I would want to do a one minute. I'd probably do maybe a five minute um or a three minute and um and see we're gonna put those types of things on one of our um on quanio when we launch that we'll have a lot of um yeah little mini series and stuff like that but yeah if you cut it up it kind of looks like you just cut it up so if you don't you know do everything in one minute three minutes whatever but one minute's tough i've seen i'm watching it (laughs) <laughs> out so so oh. thing too though if you you want to go into that aspect of ad revenue when you're streaming like in our platform right ad plays at the beginning the end and every 10 minutes so now if you have a whole bunch of like three minute episodes of a series put into an hour you're gonna make three times the amount of money by cutting up those little episodes than if it was played as one full length one. Mm. Yeah. Because he's got something commercials playing beginning and end. So mm. if you break that up, now you've got three times the amount of commercials playing on your product that you would have on a long form. You actually make more money on the shorts than you do long form. It's what you're seeing happen on TikTok right now. When you're going and scrolling every single time you look at a video, then right after it, you've got an ad and, you know, right. same type of thing is happening. So that, you know, it, what's frustrating about it, I'm not going to say frustrating, but what's, uh, I guess, challenging about it is as a filmmaker, like I, like personally, it's like, I'm only interested in making movies. I get hit mm-hmm. up all the time about making commercials and doing all this stuff, and I'm just not interested, so I decline it. I'm like, I just want to make movies. But now that we've had this conversation, it's like it's so much less effort to go and make a three-minute short series than it is to go make a 90-minute movie because you don't necessarily have to finish that three-minute short series cohesively. You can like literally do episodes throughout the year when you have time. Yeah. Right. Well, and here's the thing, you know, we're, we're, most of us are in this because of our creative side and we love telling stories and making movies, but you got to think of the business aspect of it. And that has to come first. So if you're thinking, Jason, okay, I'm going to do all these little shorts or these little projects, or I'm going to do this because I want to generate the income so that I can afford to do the type of projects that I'm passionate about. Sure. So it's like, you know, when I first decided I wanted to get back into this business, it was actually in 2001. Three years before that, I had started this delivery company where we did statewide deliveries. My whole aspect of building that business up was to give me the freedom, the time, and the money to be able to go pursue this. And that's what launched it and helped kept it going. And so, hence the formula of sharing our library of wanting to do three titles and keep building it up over the years, especially if we're smart about the content we produce, because then it's just gonna keep generating income where you're just doing this full time. So don't, leave out the business aspect 
if sometimes you got to do things that you're not most creative about, but still put 100% into it, whatever you do, take pride in it, put it out and say, okay, these little steps or these little projects are going to get me the finance and the time to be able to go do the big project. In between time, I'm honing my skills. I'm, I'm doing my craft. I'm still working at it. I'm learning. And take it from there. Just don't forget the business side of it. So before I let you guys go, uh, it's been a glorious hour. Um, <laughs> Sherry and Nancy, what, what advice... Okay, so so Sherry, you come from the aspect of a writer, right? Someone writing for film. And then Nancy, you come from the aspect of like directing and filmmaking. I'm producing. What, yeah, producing. What advice would you give someone starting out? They're, they're about to start their first project. They're about to write their first script, their first film. What advice would you give them uh, to, to help them move forward and complete that project? Um, I'm going to say, um, once you've prepared, jump in and move forward. I, I think a lot of people kind of stick on the sidelines a little bit because they don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, you're going to get closer to whatever that goal is if you take that first step, mm -hmm. even if you don't finish it. Um, I think they should, you know, try it and see what happens. Yeah, just don't pro procrastinate. Yeah, it's like jump in and just do it. Whether you fail or not, it doesn't matter. The point is, and the respect is, you're out there doing it. You're trying your best and walk away learning from your mistakes. That's the best thing. Always keep a positive attitude and learn. Okay, I did this. It didn't work. I fell. What can I take away from this? What can I improve on? And I just think... You know, that's one thing people said about us are like, the one thing we love about you, Nancy, is you're a doer. There's so many people say, oh, I'm going to make a movie, I'm going to do this, but you do it time after time. That's because we just don't sit on the sidelines and talk about it. We go out and we make it happen. However it takes to make it happen, just go do it. Right, right. No, that, that's wonderful advice. So before I let you guys go, where can people find your films? The project you have coming up next, where can people follow you guys if they want to follow you on your journey? Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Yeah, well, you can go to olivebranchfilmstudios.com. We're on, that's our main production website. And then we're social media under Olive Branch Studios. So you can find us on all of them, Facebook, Facebook TikTok, all of them. So just Search the name Olive Branch Film Studios and you'll find Great. it. We try to hashtag Olive Branch TV. And then our streaming platform, please go to Roku and download our channel. It's free. Um, that's Olive, Olive Branch TV. Olive it's on Branch Roku. TV on Roku. Make sure you guys go and download Roku. Go download their streaming platform. You got How many films do you guys have on that platform right now? I don't know. We have quite a few on there. We're adding more. I just added one this morning. That it, it was actually a short film, Escape. That's a lower winning film that's out right now. Just launched on there today. So and are these and then in September our second channel is called Quanio. We'll be launching, but we we have the link. If you go to olivebranchfilmstudios.com, it has the link to our our channel. And also, if you're creator. And you're out there and you want to submit content to us, there's a link on there. Submit your content to us. It's all non-exclusive and it's a 50-50 ad revenue share split with 24-7 transparent accounting. So send us your content. We're always looking for good content. That is awesome. Sherry, Nancy, thank you guys so much for being on the Hype okay. podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having us. You have a great day. You as well. Thank you guys.